All right. Hey, guys. Hi. What's up? <laughs> okay. So we have a third friend with us. Hey. I would say Matt should not see this guy because he will try to pull this dude right out of his, his hole and try <laughs> to release him onto the village green. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Hey, it is official. Things are starting. We're opening the tavern door. Dan. How can you not get pumped up over that song? Holy moly. So that is our new Tavern Talk theme song. Oh, it's beautiful. I hope everyone likes it. So, hey, Dan, are you ready to describe this place? Oh, yo, yeah, yeah. So what we're walking into is called uh, The Infinite Sadness. It, it's ominous looking on the outside, but when you walk in, it really is kind of neat. Uh, we see a couple patrons that we recognize. It looks like he he's writing down musical notation furiously and he has headphones on and he's listening to like these um, these really obscure beats uh, that don't Ooh. seem that don't seem like they're normal beats. But he's he's trying to incorporate them into his music. He uh, he is an, uh, an oral wizard. And uh, we're thrilled to see him. He, he, he doesn't get out much because he, he now has kind of a larger family, but it's good to see him sitting at the bar. Uh, he's sitting next to someone who, um, whenever she talks, kind of has like a weird robotic voice. Um, oh. But everything she says is pretty killing it. She's funny as heck. Uh, but it, it kind of sounds like um, like my phone is telling me directions whenever she speaks. Uh, she's she wrote her name down. Gosh, I can't read this. So, Sean, oh, no, here, hand that, over, hand that over to me. Let me, let me go, try. Go, go, right. go. Uh, Chance City. Chance City. All right. So, Chance City sounds like Vegas. I love it. Uh, so she's sitting there uh, doing cool robot voices, but I mean, making everyone laugh. It's kind of cool. Our locks, I think, may be um, sampling some of her voice things and may put them in a song later on. So I think there's a collaboration going on. It's kind of cool. I want to introduce our special guest. Oh man! Hey. Oh, there he is. What's up? He, ah, he, he popped in from the underground uh, from my badger hole. Do badgers, do badgers live in holes? I don't know where they live. <laughs> badgers live wherever they want, man. <laughs> badgers are way more alpha than we give them credit for. Well, I'm glad that we could all finally learn really about our friend Lauren. I want it's it's clear now that we're all going to see who you are, what you are, what you're made of. Ryan, Ryan, actually, can I? I, I wrote a I wrote a song for Lauren. Can I? Can I sing it? Can I? Oh. Can I perform this real fast? Wow! Oh, is this a song Honor. where you have, you have to lie down and play uh, guitar at the same time? Yeah, yeah. Oh, one, two, three, go! Like all puppets, we like to learn. And we sit back and watch the earth turn around the sun And planet Saturn We are like the tree We are like the fern But meet our new best 
best friend Unraveling the pattern That was truly beautiful oh, yeah. Gotta wipe a tear from my eye <laughs> Oh, me too I, I, Hold on, let me <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> All right, so Lauren. <laughs> no one's ever written a song for me. Thank you. Well, let me really apologize. Really First, let me apologize, and then let me say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If this is your first song, I really, I really, I, I, we could have done better. I would have tried harder. I'm sorry. <laughs> loved it. I loved Lauren, it. can you respond to this accusation? Which is that? That oh, I'm actually you? a brunette? <laughs> well, first of all, I finally chose to take off my mask and show my true self for this. I feel, felt like this was the right place to do it. So thank you for coming here, Lauren. You are our first live stream guest. Um, you people, it, we've already shown two animations during our show that are courtesy of Lauren. Lauren uh, has put together not only our animations, but animations from um, quite a few different um, people within the community and your talents are really um, gosh I mean it makes my heart warm to think that you did something for for Ryan and I like that it it, it, it still it still kind of baffles me just uh, how generous and awesome you are so oh, thank let, you. let me publicly say thank you for offering your services for us um, and for and for everyone in the community that that uh, recognizes your talent and that you have been able to shine your light upon, it's it's been it's been wonderful. You are you're helping a lot of people. <laughs> it's great. Oh, thanks. And right back at you guys. I love what you guys are doing too, and I think it's just so much fun. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Love really? fest. <laughs> everyone love fest. You know, I I take a sip for my authentic Dusty Wheel mug here. That, oh, all right, that get that in the camera. Get that in there. Oh, Check you guys that see that? Out. Everyone at home see that? For only five hundred and ninety-nine dollars, you can get yourself a limited dusty wheel. You mail it to me, and I will get you a dusty wheel paper cup. Paper cup. Paper cup filled paper with cup. the hopes filled and dreams. With, and it's unspillable. Look at all that. It's unspillable. <laughs> Demonstrate that. Look at oh. <laughs> Hey, 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 calm down, calm down. Oh, easy, easy, easy there. Got a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we've been planning on doing for a long time. We've been developing the show over, you know, the last couple of months. Thank you guys for putting up with our hiccups and speed bumps. So this is a tavern talk where we're going to be able to have spoiler discussion. So we are on chapters eight and nine for a place of safety. And then she what, what's the other one. The men tellings tell of the wheel tellings of the way hey, thank you guests and yeah, so right. this is unlike anything we've done before i'm really glad you guys are here and this is our first time for a lot of this so lauren is our test subject test badger yeah. rather <laughs> so um what we have is the chapter where ran is told he has to leave and then the chapter where maureen pretty much schools all of edmund's field as far as what's uh, their history and stuff Okay. I wanted to I wanted to ask you a question. So um before we get into Moraine's um her story, Lan comes in and says, Hey, sheep herder, trouble, come on, double time it, and runs down the stairs and then kind of goes by the door and just props open the door. I don't know exactly how far he is from Moraine. Uh, but but isn't that kind of a little bit of surprising? Just saying, you know what? Wait, 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 wait. Let let's just see what she, let's just see how this plays out. She's got it. it. It would think that a warder, the guy who's been walking around with his hand on his sword like the whole time in in town, would have like stood up and been like, "Yeah, is there a problem?" Just like Bran Alvier did and, and Master Luhan did when there was an issue with the with with the end. Yeah, Land didn't really like. He's he sees he watches and then he goes, okay, cool, she got it. And then come on, guys, out the back. And that's that seems a little weird. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I, you know, I hadn't thought about it before this, but I was wondering about sort of like when do Lan and Moraine decide to do or take on certain roles? And maybe this is getting a little bit ahead, but you know, later in the book, there are certain times when they're sort of seen discussing together, and then they decide. Oh, Lan, you better take this one or whatever. In this case, you're right. Moraine, I think 
they must have known this was coming, right? I mean, they're in a village that's got these huge stereotypes against them. Mm-hmm. They've just spent all this time with the village the last day or two, helping people, healing people. My arm's getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> You're holding this mug. Wow. Oh, oh, oh. You got a little bit of respect it's, for puppetry now, don't you? Buddy? Yeah, a lot of respect. <laughs> Jeez, but at that solid gold dusty wheel cup, he's got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that thing's way yeah, This is the light part. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, I, I do think that. Um, Moraine wasn't lying when she said she is seeking stories, that she knows stories. I think it was incredible, and it was um, something that Land was just like, yeah, you take this one. And then when she did, it was obviously one of the best moments in the first book. And I'm, I think we should definitely mention Rekapa Sedai's amazing Lego rendition of this scene, because oh my gosh. it was oh my gosh. absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it kind of, it, I got a little choked up. Well, Absolutely. I was a little jealous that he could change the facial expression so much. Yeah, I think he's he's. I uh, mean, I'm very a lot, lot of like got to work with. <laughs> <laughs> how do you? Yeah, how do you do sad? I am. Look at me. No, I look. Wait, no, come on, guys, come on. No, yeah, Dan's got them. I do have a second. I do got a second hand stick though. This is new for me. Woo! <gasps> oh, that's nice. All right, so I've leveled up. Oh, Dan, you got a second hand stick. Ah, yay. I'm going to clap for you. Thank you. Dan, Can, I, you level clap? Up. Can you clap? Look, I'm framing the, I'm flaming the wheel. Flame, I'm framing it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hey, baby um, steps. Baby steps, man. <laughs> I, I feel like we should backtrack a little bit to the previous yeah, chapter. Cha- was it, is it chapter eight about the uh, place of safety? Mm-hmm. Isn't yeah. uh, one of the episodes of the TV show called A Place of Safety? That's well, it. I have to say, one of the things that surprised me, well, I don't know if it surprised me, but I've always just remembered as I've thought back on the book that that place of safety is the inn where Rand is, right? The Winespring Inn. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's where they think they're going to be safe in Shatter Logoth, because I couldn't quite remember where that chapter takes place in the books. But g- going back and rereading it today in preparation for tonight, I realized the place of safety, as mentioned in that chapter, is specifically Tarvalon. Oh, Tarvalon, yeah. Yeah, right. and, and I think uh, the big question. Well, and obviously, there's more than one meaning to it, right? Like, I think the Wine Spring Inn is also a place of safety. It's a place where Moraine helps Tam. Mm-hmm. But to me, um, that's a big question: is will the show actually visit Tarvalin? Will we have some of those scenes, maybe from prequel stuff, New Spring stuff, or just seeing some of the politics happening in the White Tower? with Swan and others. That's what I'm looking forward to. And I hope that they actually do visit a place of safety, meeting Tarvalin mm-hmm. in that episode. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. It would be very hard to just justify a bunch of people talking about a place and never bring it up visually in a visual medium and then and call the episode a place of safety. But I thought that there was this hidden meaning to the... Or, the idea of the, a place of safety and I was digging deep into that conversation because it really did seem to me that there might have been something of a mistruth in that statement and I was trying to find it because in the end Tarvalon is not safe and, and has proven very quickly that it would not have been safe for any of the you know for Rand at least so I just wondered about that specifically where she says there is a place of safety and then there's a pause and then she starts talking about it as almost as if they're not linked in her mind or or she specifically separated them but Hi, I, boy. I, oh, hey, 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 yeah no it's okay. how you guys do it i'm gonna have to look at those special oh, effects oh wow isn't that beautiful big muscle give me you guys mind if i take a second to just pull up a chair yeah all take right, it down. Take a turn. all right and i will remove him so we don't see the gory details <laughs> who wants to see sausage made right who wants to see... <laughs> you're like te- you're teeing me up to say the worst jokes and i just i'm not i'm not i'm gonna be better i think we're ready uh we're nope oh <laughs> hey boom and, and boom Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, bro? Just like, bam! Uh, bam! Hey, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. We were guys, like, guys, there's too much sausage. What was what was I doing? I was saving them from sausage. No one told me I was going to be showing sausage. 
Well, we don't we don't really want a sausage fest at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maureen, Maureen, Maureen and her and her uh, <laughs> claiming that Parvalon is a place of safety when in fact it clearly isn't. And I just thought that was a very tricky almost lie. And I was trying to find out how it wasn't a lie. And I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that because in in every aspect, Tarvalon is not safe for Rand. Well, and, and let's not forget where this dream comes from. I mean, Basilmon is trying to get Rand to mistrust the Aes Sedai companion who is with him, right? So it's it's unclear how much Basilmon knows at this stage, but clearly he's trying to continue to cause distrust in Rand's mind and Matt's and Perrin's, because I assume they had the same dream, uh, right. right, of... Mm-hmm. This I said, I, this is another thing I want to talk about is in that chapter when he goes to Moraine and basically begs her for help and then she helps Tam. She's surprisingly um, compassionate and kind in those moments. And yet the whole time we're hearing this from Rand's point of view and he's so scared of her. He's so worried that he's making a mistake, but he's like any price to save my father. And he's my father, right? And like this, there's this whole idea of of distrust that they have for the I said, I. I, I was trying to read these chapters from the point of view of uh, your campaign ad with Sen Bui. <laughs> talking, about, <laughs> talking about how Coplin talk, talk is just simply a, a phrase started by the Alviers in order to keep power in the two rivers. Okay, go on. Right? <laughs> and I, I think the one thing is very clear. This is a backwater village. Nobody in this village besides maybe Tam has any clue about the outside world. They're all incredibly naive and they have these major stereotypes. And then, oh, oh hey, look at that. That's, hey, Shambhui! Put that over my face. That's, <laughs> that's <cool. laughs> uh, Right, so, so anyway, and then uh, you have um, Moraine come in and she completely shatters the expectations of most of the people. Right. right? She's right. immediately like, um, protecting them, healing their family members who were hurt during this battle. Now, of course, there's also some superstition, like, well, we never had Trollocs around here until an I said I showed up. So, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, no. right. But anyway, so I guess right. my point and is, so, yeah, Rand, and, and that's that. That is actually a very weird coincidence. If you're living in a village, this mm-hmm. magical woman shows up, and suddenly there's monsters everywhere. I, mean, I don't necessarily blame them. For their ignorance in that, they should have recognized that she did more good than bad. But I can also be like, yeah, we didn't have monsters until you showed up. And now suddenly we, it, you know, we have half our village burned down. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think they say they, they claim that. Right. They say you brought right. the monsters here, didn't you? Right. Right. Yeah, right. There's a logic to it. It's just very simple. <laughs> right. Another, and oh, go oh, ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to change the subject. So. Well, I I kind of was too. So I this makes me think about um, the reaction of the two rivers and Emmons Field to crime and punishment. So we have we have examples in the book where there were public executions. We had a a dragon false dragon that was burned alive in Ilium. We have a dragon fang that's scrawled on here. And then we have a torchlight committee of all these angry dudes saying, well, get out or we'll burn you out. Uh, what? So what do you think the end result could have been with that? Do you think that they uh, that they would have burned these strangers? And and to take it further, we hear about a, a horse thief five years ago that this showed up from Terrence Ferry. What do you think happened to that? <laughs> He's still buried out back. Yeah, exactly. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, obviously, Moraine was there to stop them from getting too crazy, but Correct. but so was so was Bran for that matter. I mean, Bran was like, "Are you threatening someone who's a guest in my inn?" Right now, another thing to, to point out is earlier, didn't Rand see the uh, dragon's fang scrawled on the inn door? Correct. So uh, probably the Coplins doing that, right? We can assume. <laughs> That rumor rumor would have it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love how the backwater village has the people who were like too backwater for them. They're like, oh, right. those guys. <laughs> right, right. Oh, no, there, there you go, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got Copland talk. Oh, well, we, you should get a brand buck in there, though, <laughs> if he does a good. <laughs> <laughs> who gets the brand buck? He's giving his time and effort to be here. Give oh, that's the only buck. reason I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
There you go. That guy looks strangely familiar. All right, so we have a <laughs> this is a great comment from chat. Eggman is the only one who didn't catch the two rivers xenophobia. Yes. I agree. I agree. And, and uh, Tom Marilyn is a little uh, problematic when he was like, oh, hey, that little pretty slip of a girl. And then talking to Egwin saying, yeah, you want to hand me my apparatus and all this stuff. <laughs> and Egwin's the only one that kind of stood up to him saying, you shouldn't talk like this. This is my name is a respected person in our village. Back off, buddy. Yeah. And, uh, and he and he, and that caused him to go. I, I meant no offense. I. I apologize, but it was only because a 16 year old stood up to like a 60 year old man. Right. It's awesome. You know, speaking of Tom, uh, the, another thing I noticed this time around is that um, uh, Lan is sort of suspicious of Tom, of Tom at first. There's a moment in A Place of Safety where he's like, I don't know about that Glee man. And I don't know if this was Robert Jordan's attempt to sort of shed some distrust towards Tom for the reader because. You know, I, I, when I read this book the first time, I was too young to have any clue that there were any side characters who may have brought the Trollocs. And it wasn't until the ending of the book when you find out who actually brought the Trollocs. But reading it through this time, I'm like, oh, they're trying to kind of make us distrust Tom. And isn't it odd that, and again, I'm getting a little ahead of the chapters we're talking about, but Tom is like, oh, I'll join you guys. You know, why is he so interested in joining them? Of course, we find out later it's because he's scared that these boys are getting tied up with Aes Sedai like his nephew did. But at the time, there's reasonable there's there's reason to distrust him right to think maybe he's a dark friend correct and even tam says well of course he was probably out there how do you think his coat got singed but there was no like first hand like eyewitness saying yeah i saw him battling it they were just like well what do you think his cloak got burned by the fireplace well it may have (laughs) but there's i mean we assume that tom was out there kicking some ass with some some knives and and some juggling right and now but i know but there's a lot of assumptions and i thought that was really interesting that tam said that because is he also picking up anything through the water bond Mm. from from moraine can he or is he just having like an independent assessment free of moraine I mean, because it seemed like when they met in the in the in the Gleeman chapter, mm. there was very much some heavy, heavy, high end uh, dealing going on, and it seemed like that was more and more tense moments in the book so far. Right. So it didn't surprise me that Lan would say that. It almost surprised me that Lan would say it out loud. Right. Okay. So this is another thing I want to bring up. Oh yes. You know, we talk all the time about how Moraine is is um, never communicating with the boys, like. If she would have just been a little more open with them, they would have trusted her more and things would have been better. Maureen always keep, keeps things close to her chest. And yet, in these first chapters, even when we very first meet her in, in the Strangers chapter, she's like mumbling things to herself as if to be heard by Rand, um, like mm-hmm. talking about, I, I can't remember in this chapter what, what she says specifically, but she's sharing, she's oversharing, in my opinion. <laughs> like well, she's, well, yeah, she, yeah, admits to, she admits to him that the Amerlin gave her the, the, the the yeah and yeah so she's definitely so several things are happening first she's announcing we talked about this in an episode before like why exactly. they kind of came into two rivers dressed to the nines telling everyone basically you know hey race to die here, 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 yeah and here's, here's my here's, ring here's my ring check that out here's my real name oh. all these so, yeah, exactly. We, we were talking about why exactly do they advertise themselves so prominently when they go to Pear Lane, they go to Camelin, and they are uh, Alice and Andra. Hey, we're Alice and Andra. Don't say our real names. But they, but they go to the two rivers and announce, I mean, and there's a peddler there, there's a, there's a Gleeman, and, and obviously things got disrupted, but that news would have spread. Yeah. And we were wondering if this was like her beacon fire to the White Tower saying, yo, Moraine is back. Moraine is back. And she's in the two rivers and she's on her way back. Yeah. Uh, a couple of good questions in the chat. First of all, you know, th- there are a lot of people who don't really buy the whole uh, Moraine and Tom uh, romance. It's so, so, so super subtle. But I agree with this comment that says their declarations of love are very Diaz Damar, essentially just knowing looks. I think there's almost like this extra 4, 4D chess that Moraine and Tom are playing from the moment they see each other that first time. 
they're playing Dice Damar against each other and sort of testing each other's limits and realizing just how good the other is at it. And I think they gain this admiration for each other completely in the white spaces between the text, right? Mm -hmm. So was she flirting with him or was she letting him know that I know that you killed a family member of mine and and I can hurt you. Uh, it, there, there's a lot going on there. I got, I got the impression that Tom got out of there by the skin of his teeth, and if he had answered incorrectly, he would not have seen the end of the night. Yeah, there was a point there, right, when Lan was like considering killing Tom, right? Yeah, yeah. It just seems like even in that, uh, there's some stories I like and some I don't. And that was right after he said how the how the dragon tried to free the dark one from his prison, which is false. And 30 seconds later, Moraine shows up and kind of puts an end to all these little stories. And th there is a real tension there that in retrospect, we're like, holy cow, that who did they recognize each other? And did she recognize that this may have been someone who actually killed someone who she was related to? And, and mm. this is uh, levels on levels on levels or or what? Or is it just saying, hey, hey. Yeah, I'm a nice die, but don't say anything. Uh, we don't know yeah. what levels they were going on, but there are many levels that were in the history of these two people. Right. And it's and, weird to see it. And there are hints that Moraine at least knows that he knows that she's Aes Sedai. Correct. But does she also know that he is the quote unquote gray wolf and, and the, the master of Dias Damar? I mean, you would think she would know who he was because of his close relationship with Queen Morgaze as well. Correct. And she does address him as Master Bard at first, which yep. is a right. short title. Yeah, I, I think she was letting him know she knew who he was. Yeah, And I think he knew to be extremely wary from that point on. But also, I think he kind of respected that in her. Um, there's some other really good comments here. Uh, Look at this guy right in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm taking over. You guys, I, I kind of I, I have my hands full. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it says, is it just me or are male characters never accused of not sharing enough information? Um, I'm pretty sure every character in this series should be accused of not sharing enough information. Oh, it's and so this is certainly This is certainly not limited to Moraine or any females in the, in the series. But that being said, we're meant to feel Rand's frustration that Maureen is keeping things from him. I, I also kind of agree with this other comment. Look, young guys are justified in demanding to know more than they're actually qualified to know if they're superior. Um, if they're superior, there's a woman. This She's comparing this to Holdo from Star Wars. I tend to agree with that, too. It's like, why do they deserve to know? I don't know. They, they were whisked away from their village by this mysterious woman who's not being very open about why they were whisked away. Um, but right. And, and I don't think that she, I mean, she did give a rational explanation for them to leave and, and she left it up to Rand to decide. I think Rand is deficient in talking about, uh, his dreams. He had that crazy dream in this. Oh, yeah. and decided, they all are. Uh, they don't decide to, and Matt is a liability in this issue, but Perrin and, and Rand decide not to disclose that there was a dark writer. They also, uh, yeah, there's quite a few things in which the males, uh, should, should share their, their feelings and thoughts and decide that, um, they'll be made fun of or <laughs> or it's a dumb idea or it's dangerous or they're uh, the, I, I think it I in, in my reading so far it tends to be pretty even handed yeah uh, male and female as far as just being dumb and non-communicative we're all equally dumb yeah well I, I do think the series would have been over in four books if that everyone had just communicated with each other but <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I actually do also like that Robert Jordan wanted us to feel distrust of certain characters. I mean, there was even some red herrings in The Great Hunt where is Moraine a dark friend? Like, we're not clear. It's not clear. I think that was all meant to be sort of covered in shadow. Um, and obviously, looking back on it now, we're like, yeah, why was Moraine so cryptic? Or why didn't the boys share this or that? But it's because we've come to trust the characters, right? Yep. Yeah, it's, hard to, it's hard to remove yourself from everything we know. You try your best, but it's hard to remove yourself from the, the, knowing the ending. Basically, we don't well, need to that, say it. But, and right. that's why, well, and that's why a certain brown Aja was such a surprise because we actually 
got to know this person and like this person. And then when there was this announcement of a shift, it was shocking. I mean, I didn't see it coming at all. Um, I didn't even conceive of it, to be honest. But but I'm I'm getting smarter. I'm getting smarter. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Another good comment, man. Something uh, Moraine is practically brown Aja in her love of research. I mean, she has to. I don't know that she was originally that way, but after what happened in New Spring, she had no choice but to learn everything she could. Right? She was constantly yeah. in search of knowledge and stories. That's what she was chasing for near on twenty uh-huh. years, right? Yeah, that's one of her first lines. Or the, the I'm a student of history. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Land is ta- uh, basically explaining to Rand what a murdraw is, and he says this. He says a half man. He goes half man have the dark one's own luck. Oh yes. Uh, now, um, is uh, well, is this a metaphysical truth, and is it related? <laughs> and is it related to Matt? Well, first of all, I ain't, I ain't no dusty wheel, so I can't answer that. Um, <laughs> I should pretty, I should research. Pretty close. Well, your puppet, your puppet <laughs> like a cold mug. Yeah. yeah, the secret is uh, he he fixes all of my scripts before my videos come out because I get so many things wrong. Uh, <laughs> oh, you, you're. Yeah. <laughs> There's the sausage, everyone. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Like, I'll edit that out later. Pay no always. attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, you know, I I have a theory about this. Do you remember when they are offered wine in one of their dreams? Rand refuses to drink the wine. Mm-hmm. I think that um, Matt drank the wine in that moment. And I think when that happened... It was almost like he was given some sort of Dark One's luck. And I don't mean good luck. I mean very bad luck. I mean, it's from that point on when he reaches out for the dagger. The dagger curses him for two full books. Oh, um, Eventually, uh, and, and you could also argue that this is just his Taviran nature. I mean, clearly, he is Taviran at the moment that Min sees him because, you know, she sees all those things above him. But I just think something happened with Matt when he drank that wine. Oh, he, he never wanted to admit it and he never did a fully admit it. if I remember correctly Rand says did you drink the wine and he sort of like shrugs it off like I'm not going to oh. talk about it but maybe there's something to that um, the dark one's own luck remember from that point on when Matt starts to have lots of luck mm-hmm. he hates it when people sit, compare him to the dark one he hates it violently right I think that's just his Tavira nature at that point I think Whatever the Dark One or the Shatter Logoth Blade did to him was completely rooted out of him in uh, the Dragon Reborn at the White Tower. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I think, I mean, as we know later, he's immune to Shatter Logoth or to uh, Mashadar, right? So clearly he's something special on top of his Taviran and um, luck nature. So I really like that. And it helps me out because I've had a problem and I had a problem the second time when I read it. The decision to grab the dagger seemed so out of character for Matt. He literally starts talking about treasure. He's like, oh, look at the treasure. We want to, he, he started like exhibiting this greedy side that I don't really, re- maybe I, I'll, I'll see this through the rest of the read through, but I don't remember him being like that. And so if you know. gave me a very nice explanation, like it could like, be explained away by the wine like that's amazing well and, and you remember in the dream when uh, basilmon tries to get Rand to drink the wine he's like yes yes drink it like there's something about it maybe it's got some sort of compulsion associated with it who knows but um you know rand when rand's like no i'm not gonna drink this he kind of like comes to his senses and that's constantly what rand does in his dreams we only see those dreams from his point of view we don't see them from matt or from a parent's point of view but every time rand sort of like centers himself and is like no this is a dream Bazamon gets frustrated and Rand has more control, similar to someone who was in Tal- Teleron Riyadh, right? Someone who knows they're in a dream and can control it. I think um, it's likely that Rand is in a dream shard at that stage and um, he, he's not supposed to be able to resist it, but because he is who he is, he's constantly resisting it, which frustrates Bazamon. I don't know that Matt had that kind of strength, but to answer your other thing, the dagger remember Min saw a ruby hilted dagger above mm. Matt and Rand tells that to Matt he says she says she saw a ruby hilted dagger I was like ooh ruby, ruby hilted dagger huh that sounds mm. cool almost like that greed starts at that moment so it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's like um, he was keeping his eyes out for it almost 
right? There are so many examples of that, and I wondered if they do that to throw us off the scent or to actually kind of create this like vague gray area where maybe all prophecy is self-fulfilled in that re- in that way. I mean, that's very true. Um, and I, I kind of have to say, I don't think it's out of character and that's in chat as well. I think Matt has always been the greedy one. He's always the one who likes shiny things. Yeah. Um, and later that certainly doesn't change. His love of gold is apparent. But I do think it's odd that he just happened to find that dagger. I think, it, I mean, obviously there's nothing odd about it. He, he was meant to find it. But is right. the dagger important or could he have picked up some random piece of gold? From I was going to ask that too, yeah. Yeah, Do I imagine know? I imagine anything there was tainted. Uh, That's but, what I think. But like you said, he was destined to pick up that, and it was uh, she had seen the future. Yeah, it could have been a bag that had like a dollar sign filled with gold coins spilling out. You know, and, and if that's what he grabbed, then that's what it would have been. Can you imagine? And then Pat and Fane would have had. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. And then Pat and Fane would have had to go and gather each one of those uh, coins from all the different people in order to fill whole. Money, thankfully, money, it was money, just money. the one. It was just the one dagger to get him back to himself. I don't necessarily see Perrin being to Varen in the first book. I think that mm. it comes later, and I know that Moraine says, "Oh, wow, three to Varen in one village." I don't think she's qualified to really say that. She doesn't have the talent. She pro- and to me, it's not until like the color swirl starts to happen that we see that there is this inherent to barrenness. I don't see. Yeah. I see with Rand. I see him. I mean, it's obvious. People are marrying when they hate each other. They're falling off of ladders and breaking their neck. They're doing all yeah. these crazy things. With Matt, he knows. He. I mean, he has the dice tumble. He's like, time to roll the dice. Boom, and he know he knows that his luck is what it is. With Perrin, uh, I mean, what is it? Good knot tying? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, there's there's some hints that uh, Perrin's Taviran abilities are more related to his ability to influence people through speech, uh, especially in the fourth book uh, when he goes back to the two rivers and he's just like, "Why is everyone listening to me? Like I'm some leader?" And before he realizes what he's doing, he's convincing all of these people to just go off and pack up all of their things and run off to. Um, the two river or to Emmons Field and everything. So I think for Perrin, also, I mean, to be fair, he got way off track in the first book and it led him to Elia, Elias, Elias, the, the only person who could guide him to communicating with the wolves. I mean, is that chance? No, that's Taviran, right? He, they, they were, yeah. they were like 200 miles off course or something crazy like that. He and Egwene. So I think even then his, his Taviran ness was there, maybe just not as strong. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. As far as like being a wolf brother, uh, yeah, it was it was fortuitous to run into Elias, but it, it, but that nature didn't really get triggered until he hung out with them. And I wonder, to a certain degree, if he had just stayed in the two rivers, would he have? Would his eyes have turned yellow? What, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I mean, I don't know, I don't know that he could. I like think they you. would have all died if they hadn't been together. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, and I do agree with that. And I know that there's a Tavaran pull, but I also know that Tavaran is not, you're not born Tavaran and then you're Tavaran until you die. Great. It's there when the pattern needs you. And then once it doesn't need you anymore, you're no longer it. And so my theory was that in the first two books, I don't necessarily see a true Tavaran. I do I do see some, some fortuitous things as far as him getting guides and stuff. Um, and we can attribute that to Tavaren. Uh, but it's not like Matt throwing a, you know, a cup and it landing on its side or, or, you know, yeah. that weird stuff. Well, none of that stuff happens with Rand either until about book three, right? That's when it really starts to go off the rails. Like anywhere he goes, it's just like, you can see the pattern tightening around that area. Yeah. Right? I mean, um, I would, I would almost argue though, that the fact that Tam was the one who found him might be his original Taveran pull. Taveran pull, yeah. Right. Now, because, you know, I it's still I have questions about Tam. Tam just seems to have like the one meditation technique that happens to give him the ability to unlock everything. He 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 whisks him away to a to a little village and, and protects him in isolation. He doesn't take another bride. He doesn't let anyone get close. He doesn't he understand my whole feeling, my whole my, my theory is that Tam kind of knew what was going on. Maybe yeah. he was following prophecy all along and that he um, 
just kind of, and, and, that, and that could then go back to this chapter, explain why kind of Tam basically lets him go very quickly. He is as, as, as if he knew, you know, ran, he wakes up out of his dream, his sleep, and ran goes, Hey, I gotta go. And he's like, Yeah, I get it. Good luck, bro. Right. Well, like, wait, 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 you're not gonna stop me? And he's no, like, Yeah, no. Luck, no. Luck, and you know what seals that theory even more is the extra prologue that Robert Jordan wrote when they split the eye of the world into two books. What? Wait, what's oh, going on? Raven, Ravens? Yeah, Ravens. Yeah, uh, I read that. <laughs> in that, Tam tells these children the story of the dragon. Correct. Right? And it's like, he's thinking what? about it. He knows the prophecies. What? I, I think I, it's... No! Yeah. No, I came up with it myself and Dan <laughs> thought I was crazy! No. Nope. Dan no. thought I was crazy! You're not crazy anymore. No, I, I genuinely believe that uh, Tam I absolutely knew that something was up with his son. I think he hoped it wasn't true, but I think he also raised him... He raised him well. I, Another thing that is kind of hard to notice in these first chapters is Rand is a leader. He oh, is, man. He oh, yeah. takes over. There's moments when he's like, look, let's just unload these casks of brandy first and then we'll go play or whatever. You know, like he's constantly convincing Matt to be a better person. He's constantly sort of accidentally being a leader. And you can see that from his his dad. And his dad says that um, right before he leaves. Like, yeah, I guess you're not a boy anymore, you know? <laughs> Um, and then Maureen, I think she also senses that. That's why she gets Rand on board first. And then Rand's like, well, I better go tell Matt and Perrin. She's like, I'll take care of that. I would not be surprised if she went to them and said, hey, Rand's on board. You know, right. you should come right. too. I think right. that's what they needed because. And she know. was so exhausted. Oh, I can't even walk. And then Rand says, okay, I'll go. And she's like, all right, no, no, I'll talk to Perrin. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right. So, and also, you know, this also helps me out because I've been questioning how two things. How did um, Perrin and Matt survive? Mm-hmm. It made me, it, I believe that Tam warned them somehow and they were somehow able to keep them alive. And then when Moraine said, I'll go get them, Rand said, oh, go, you know, Moraine says, I got it. And then she goes off. We don't know how they arrive and they never tell us that story. It just right. seems to me that it makes sense that Tam knew, warned everybody. And that's why there is an ease of letting the kids go because Tam had already given them that knowledge. Well, there is no letting the kids go. She tells them to just write notes and we're leaving in the middle of the night. I do wonder what she said to scare them because in Rand's case, he's like, well, I guess I owe you a favor now because you healed my dad and I said I'd do anything. Right. But in the case of Matt and Perrin, she didn't have that to hold over them. So I wonder if she did just use Matt or uh, Rand as saying Rand's on board. He understands Tam almost died. This is serious. Leave a note. You know, because that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, both Matt and Perrin left notes, right? Yeah, they, did, they didn't tell anyone. And I think just doesn't Rand well, get right? angry when Rand's like, "Yeah, I told my dad." Yeah, they're like, "Well, thanks for listening, chump." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, right. I, I have one more question uh, as far as this. So, when we're talking about the prophecy of Dragon Mount, I know that you have a theory that the wind. Mm-hmm. equals the creator at some points. So wow. when when Tam comes across, when we hear in his fever dream, he's like, oh, uh, the, the women, they sometimes fight. She died giving birth. The baby, she covered with a cloth, but the wind had bl- blown it. The baby was cold. God, so, geez, wait, guys, see that acting? That Do you amazing. see how effortless that is? It's uh, so good. We're taking this for granted. I, I just I geez, thought it, you were dying just then. Hey, no, no, hey. I'm 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 I've been dead this whole time. I mean, I'm <laughs> lifeless. Yeah. So, do you think that that um, that that was the creator interjecting Boy. into well, into? Well, now I do. It? Now I do. I forgot See? about that. Hey! Uh, so here's the thing. My theory about the creator being the wind is not fully settled yet. I haven't. I'm, I'm still working on it. Um, I'm also kind of feeling like maybe the creator is sort of just in nature in general. Is Tan the creator? <laughs> no, well, no, Bella is, but uh, <laughs> I also have a theory that uh, Rand's mother, uh, Tigraine, is that her name? Uh-huh. Shail, Shail Tigraine. Uh, she didn't die. I think she may be Nakomi. 
Okay, so we had a debate. Okay, okay so I challenged I challenged a whole group of people on live. I said, hey, did we see the dead mom? And everyone said yes, and I still don't see it. I reread it. We do not see a body. There's blood. There's blood. Did we just, I know, but do we see a dead mom? No, and nowhere yeah. is there a prophecy that says his mother will die, right? Uh -huh. Or is there? Maybe I'm wrong. I, I could be wrong. I don't know everything. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think we need to talk about the, the, the coolest part of these chapters now, which is oh, the uh, tellings of the wheel. Right? We got to talk about this story of Manetherin. So tell me, when you heard this, when you heard this story, how did it initially hit you? And, and what, what have you gleaned mm -hmm. from it since you've been reading more and more? Well, it's funny. Everyone talks about how wonderful the, that scene is. And when I first read the books, that thing, that all went way over my head. And so I was just like, let's get back to the action. <laughs> That's all I remember from reading the books the first time. This time around, I was reading it. And, uh, well, first of all, I saw Rikappa's uh, Lego telling of it. And that really brought it to life for me for the first time. Oh, I yeah. kind of always just ignored it before then. This time when I listened to it, I'll tell you the one thing that stood out to me that was really cool and shocking and interesting. Eldrine, the fact that she somehow used the one power to simultaneously burn herself out and every other channeling dreadlord in the area mm -hmm. all at once oh, yeah. from the heart of Manetherin. How did she do that? That's well, insane. Does, doesn't Rand kind of do something like that? Where he was able to do an attack where he only killed like bad guys, Wait, maybe in tier, was it? Am I making this up? This is memory. This is like 10 year old memory. <laughs> I remember in uh, the Stone of Tear, in book yeah. four, they're attacked by Trollocs, and he uses some weave that just like hones in on the on the uh, Trollocs and kills them all. And then later, when he wants to do it again, he's like, "I forgot how I did that." Which uh -oh. that would be handy to remember. But then later, 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 like in Towers of Midnight, you know, when we have Jesus Rand, he um, he uses like an insane amount of power and does something even more incredible. And remember, there's a dark friend in the midst of the people in that city. I think it's in um, somewhere in the Borderlands. And the guy, like he burns, it like burns his eyes out because Rand is glowing and it's like seeing the light come oh, to yeah. life. And the guy like can't stand it, so he like rips his own eyes out. Oh, that's that's lovely, isn't it? All right. <laughs> Rand was also able to just stare at people and 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 make them just go, "I'm a dark friend, I'm a dark <laughs> Right. <laughs> Which is awesome. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not here. I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, the storms that hunt the shadow spot. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, maybe uh, Eldrain Eldrain used a similar. Uh, weave. Well, but, could, but specifically I, dreadlords. I mean, these are channelers that she well, attacked. Actually, well, actually, uh, if I can, does it? It seems like the, she may have done a a frame of Carvalon <laughs> type thing. Jesus, <laughs> look at this. Yeah, it's both. <laughs> it's both. Do, wasn't Eldraine's fate uh, a parallel to Egwin? Oh yeah, certainly. Uh, and there are some who believe that she's Eldraine reborn, right? Oh, what? I mean, I don't know that that matters. I, no, I mean that. Uh, I've, okay, I've okay well, that, that, that confirms that then, because she drew enough power to not only destroy everyone around her, but herself as well. And that that really parallels with Eggman. I that's how I had seen her story in retrospect. But, but no. I, I, I like though that Eggman Eggman didn't do it um, for some man. She did it. To yeah, save humanity, save humanity, and right, to yeah. stop the balefire, um, whatever. Yeah. What was that called? Like the the flame of Tarballon or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she. Yeah, she's definitely not. That was not a romance story. Or that was not an epic romance story. You know, I also think it's fair to say we don't know if the story that Maureen is telling is accurate. Can you know, she lie? Oh well, no, she can't lie, but Come she on. can tell a story the way she thinks it's true, and we know that legends become myth and myth fades and like who knows if the the details are actually true the way Man, she oh, thinks i was too busy weeping for manatharin to think that it <laughs> might not be real no i'm gonna weep for what is lost i'm like i will thank you <laughs> it's all a lie no it's certainly not a lie but i think <laughs> i don't know that it's the most romantic story the way that it's portrayed is all i'm saying yeah, I think yeah a lot of people true. died and it was really miserable Right. Yeah. And I and I like in that story that you have like the Terran was the Terran drill, the Menethenadrel, 
that you call the White River or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, he, and uh, there was, and even Emmons Field was King Amon. You can see where they, okay, okay, yeah, things get lost here in translation. Maybe they, you know, instead of saying Worcestershire, they just go Worcestershire. You know, and that's that's where Edmonds Field said Amon, you know, stuff like that. I, I kind of dug that that little world world building aspect uh, a lot, actually. Yeah, for sure. You want to get into more crazy metaphysics. What's the old blood and how does that work? Mm-hmm. It's almost like she was awakening the old blood in the people by give, telling them like, hey, yeah, there's something about you and where you come from that you need to be reminded of. Mm-hmm. And it is almost like this sobering moment for them when they're like, oh. Oh, this is this is legit. Another thing, I wonder if Tom was watching from the side and he's like, "Man, she's good at the game of houses. She's hot and she tells stories better than me. <laughs> she's my perfect woman." <laughs> and, and she's like a, a flame dancer. <laughs> well, and here's how she starts. She goes, "Quote: Is this what Amon's blood has come to? Little people squabbling for the right to hide like rabbits." Oh, End quote. oh it's so deep. Oh my gosh. Burn. And she's this little woman who just speaks and, and wasn't like yelling, was just like scornful. Everything was just like, you guys are pathetic. Holy mm. cow. You come at me with torches? Is this what Eamon's blood has come to? These little rabbits? <laughs> yeah. You're right. Threat. It is a display of power. I mean, it is her just being like, watch yourself. Like, I could destroy you where you stand. You know. Yeah, but it also hits them in their shame. These are proud people, and she knows that they are. She's been with them for a couple of days now. She she gets this pride, and she's like, "You people are nothing. You are yeah. nothing. Two Rivers folk are not. Are, you just want to run and hide. You guys are, are spa. This is what you your blood is. And yeah, I like that awakening of the old blood. Like instantly, people are just like, "Oh gosh, <laughs> all right, bye." Mm-hmm. But, you know, that actually answers the question from earlier, too. This is why Moraine had to step in and do this and not Lan. Because she needed to display the very power they were afraid of and show them that shame. And you were like, you're right. They're such proud people. If Lan had gotten up and threatened them with a sword, it would have caused a riot. But she was, like, threatening them with something they did not understand. Right? Right. It, it, he just, I brought it up earlier because he showed a nuance that wasn't really evident earlier with him him staying back and letting Moraine handle this. I mean, he was he was a wolf amongst sheep uh, 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 the whole time there and the fact that he subdued himself was the wise way. It yeah. was just it was just a a, a subdual that that wasn't really part of uh, his character up until then. Right. You know what else is cool is way later when I said I returned to the two rivers, the at least the women's circle have respect for I said I at that point. You know, they How? they they keep well, yeah, some of them. Yeah. Alana and Varen mm-hmm. are taken care of by the women's circle. Um, they keep it from the uh, village council, mostly probably because of Saint Louis. Let's be honest, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> I'll a- give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> he's not above reproach. I think the world's rough on him, but he's not above reproach. Well, you know what? Sometimes the squeaky wheel breaks the tractor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, there's one more comment, and then we should probably take a intermission yeah. to do our have, have some fun. I've gotten way deep and nerdy. I hope you guys are okay. With oh this. man, I want you every beautiful. week. This is, this is yeah. so much fun. <laughs> oh man, I could talk about this series forever. Um, I think Matt is a reincarnation of Eamon. That is a popular theory, and that's one that I am totally okay with. I think one of the things that was very confusing at first with Matt's character, um, until Robert Jordan made some clarifications, uh, it was where do these other memories come from? Mm-hmm. You know, Matt does have this, the old blood in him. He is able to speak the old tongue way before he even gets mm-hmm. the dagger. Right. Or he's, he's at least able to sort of speak it and sort of understand it. But so is Egwene, for that matter. It, and, it was, was his first use of the old tongue after blowing the horn? No, his first use oh. of the old tongue is before they enter Shroud of Logoth. When uh, they do like a battle cry, he does like a battle cry. And he's like, and Egwene is like, Tyshar or whatever. Yeah. And Egwene is like, I feel like I understood that. It's almost like yeah, I remember that. hearing a whisper, you know? Um, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So there's something there with the old the old blood in them for sure. Wow. But when Matt eventually has all these holes in his memory, that's due to uh, the dagger being, you know, he, he's being healed from the effects of the dagger. Then he has all these holes in his memory. 
because I guess reasons, <laughs> I don't know, but right. Mashadar or whatever, Mordeth made its way into his brain and they had to like remove parts of his memory or something. But, and then um, later when he goes through the redstone door frames, that's when he's given memories of completely other random strangers who had gone through the door frames previously. They weren't his past lives as a lot of us suspected at first. It was just random heroes who had gone through before whose memories, the, was it Aelfin or Eelfin? I never remember which is which. Right, they gave him these enough. memories of random other heroes, and that's what he's his head is filled with. And they just so happen to be brave heroes who fought in a lot of battles. And so he remembers the face of Arthur Hawkwing. He remembers all these other things because he has the memories of all these people who lived before that weren't actually him in previous lives. Does that make sense? Well, mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, um, yeah, that you... I would think only heroes and brave dudes went through that that angry owl or Turing tur- growl rather. The um, I wouldn't think that people who didn't. I I don't know. I would think that only like generals and and like tough people would do that because it's like kind of right. a great thing. It, it doesn't seem like it's for the weak of heart to to go through this and address. You know, have like all these lives kind of flash before your your eyes this is right. a, a cool thing and in fact some people i don't think make it out alive so i think you have yeah. to be kind of stout of heart to, to even go through the darn thing yeah and i think robert jordan basically said that in an interview he said oh yeah these are the only the bravest people went through and so these are people who oh. had a lot of battle experience and a lot of you know understanding of the world and had experienced war and things and the alefin or eofin whichever they are they basically siphon off memories from people. That's how they sort of get their kicks, right? So, right. so they're, then, they're then regurgitating these memories that they've siphoned from previous people back into Matt because he asks for that, right? He says, I want these bloody holes in my memory filled. And they're like, done, because they have memories to give, right? So right. Oh, wow. that's awesome. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's wrap up this part. No, I think that's so we, we're at the end of our show. This has been an excellent. Thank you guys for all coming out. And Lauren, although we, this is the first, well, not the first time that we've been on screen together, but the first time that we've ever had a guest, you are our oldest and dearest friend in this community. Aww. Uh, no, for real. No, for real. Yeah, you are so encouraging and loving and, and uh, it, everything that you do makes me smile. So thank oh, you for being nice. on our show. Uh, for real. It's, it's, it's a joy and a pleasure. And Thank I you hope, so much. I hope we're able to do it again soon, man. You're fun. Oh yeah, that was fun. I the games were fun. I gotta be. I gotta liven up more. Oh no, you're great, man. You had a puppet. What are you talking about? Your, arm, your arms must be so tired. I I lasted what maybe ten minutes with that. Puppet. <laughs> oh, no. hey, you know what? No, no, let's not take. I mean, if you saw me walking around, you'd see that I have just one big Popeye forearm, <laughs> and then the other arm is just a withered husk. It's great for us. Thank you so much, Lauren. I wanted to end with uh, by showing everyone one last video. This is your demo video. I was oh, very yeah. excited. This is uh, explain this before I show it. Uh, yeah, so motion graphic artists or animators, which is what I am, uh, often will compile some of their work together into what they call a demo reel. So it's just like a, a flashy, here's some of my work example, right? So this is just kind of like an ad, but this is also kind of old and I'll tell you, 99% of the work I do is under um, NDA, and so I'm not allowed to show it on the internet. And so sometimes I do some fun, sometimes I do some fun side projects, and when I do, I compile them into a demo reel. And when I get antsy at my job and start looking for another job, I update a new demo reel. So this is some of my work, but this is from like 2017. Um, so yeah, it's just some of my animation work, some of the stuff I'm allowed to show. Well, I'm stoked to see it. Let's see. It. Yeah, thanks for showing it. Okay, so I will play this, and then after that, I will actually play some real music, and I will fit. I made that work. I'll make it work, and then we'll just be done. And thank you guys so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you guys, and thanks, Chat. You guys were awesome. Yeah, thanks for thank you. hanging out. Thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, awesome. You guys are beautiful. This whole world is beautiful right now. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. I want to give you this moment, Dan. No. I like to teach the world, the world to sing. I like to play this game.